Good day, Redeemer Fellowship. Pastor Joe here. And like I said last week, uh, I wanted to come back and talk a little bit more about self-control, self-discipline, specifically in the context of the Christian life and how we can begin to think through uh, the practical outworkings of this aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. So if you haven't seen last week's video on self-control, I would encourage you to watch that first. But if you're here and you're ready to go, then we should jump right in because I don't want anyone to be confused about what self-control really is as, as a fruit of the Spirit, as, as an aspect of the Christian life. When we're talking about self-control, we're not emphasizing you simply trying harder, and we're not talking about you being more committed. It's much deeper than that, and it's much more connected to the grace of God than that. As I defined it last week, self-control in the Christian world, in the biblical sense, is the ongoing control or management of your thoughts and your desires and your actions by bringing them into a willing submission to the rule of God's Word. So it's, it's bringing yourself consciously, intentionally, under the rule and the reign of God as revealed in His Word. And that's a pretty big picture general idea, and it might lead you to ask, okay, so where do I begin? I mean, our lives are big and they're complex, and there are a lot of different uh, nooks and crannies to the life, to our lives where you know we might not completely understand all of the things that need to change. So let's just say on the front end, you will be uncovering areas of your life that need deep cleansing, deep change, and a lot of attention uh, for the rest of your uh, earthly life. You, you will constantly be uncovering areas where you need to repent or change. But one way that I have been finding is helpful for me to investigate my life and address those problem areas where maybe I lack self-control or, or self-discipline is to start with the big picture area of my life areas of my life and, and address five specific arenas, right? So when I look at my life and I look at the areas that I, I want to focus on, I tend to break them down into these five arenas. Uh, the arenas are faith, love, work, health, and rest. Faith, love, work, health, rest. I break them, I break my life down into those five. Now you could break them down into three or 10. It, I mean, it, there's a hundred different ways in which we could do this. But for me, this makes sense. And I want to walk you through, uh, this will be a short video, right? I, I just want to walk you through some, some scripture and some practical ways to begin to look at these arenas of your life because these tend to require some real attention by most people. So let's start with faith, for example. Now, when I say the arena of faith, of course, all of life is... Uh, impacted by our faith. Um, there is no area of our life that is secular or worldly and separate from the spiritual life. So that's not what I'm suggesting. But when I talk about the arena of faith, I'm talking about your faith in Christ, your fellowship with God, your communion with God. And maybe a, a helpful passage to consider as you're looking at this aspect of your life is in John 15 verses 4 through 11, where Jesus starts to get into the whole aspect of abiding. Here Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love." If you keep my commandments, 
you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. In this passage on abiding in Christ, Jesus is talking not about our positional standing before the Lord. He's not talking about our justification, our forgiveness, um, our reconciliation to the Lord. It's not what he's talking about. He is talking about this experiential aspect of our relationship to him. Uh, He's talking about communion with him, communion with the Lord. And he says to abide in me is connected to um, a of the Word of God abiding in us, right? So we, we take Christ's words, the Scripture itself, to abide in, to have communion and fellowship with the Lord experientially requires an investment in the Word and the Word being invested in us. Um, we are supposed to abide in His love, right? So if we're going to maintain this experiential communion with God, then we need to be grounded and, and focused on the love of of Christ. Now, where do we see God's love? Well, we see it in the sacrifice of Jesus for sinners. So even here, to have healthy fellowship with the Lord, we need the Word of God, but we also need an emphasis on the gospel itself, the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. Another aspect of this abiding is to keep the commandments of God, right? To uh, Not to earn His favor or to earn His love, but as a demonstration of our dependency on him and our delight in his will, we keep his commands. And and the, the consequence of this, of course, is that we experience the joy of the Lord. Spend time in John 15 as you're considering your faith and your your walk with the Lord. And what we'll do for each of these and what I want you to do, I'm not going to do the work for you, what I want you to do in your life is to consider your heart and your habits as it relates to each arena. So as you consider faith and your faith and your fellowship with the Lord, check your heart and check your habits. Um, now you might be have a, you might struggle with coming to to terms with exactly what your where your heart is at and what your habits are. So you might have to come back to this as we look at these other intersecting arenas. But what I'm asking you to do, in the context of self control and self discipline, is to identify areas of weakness and frailty and struggle, as well as areas of strength. Because what we're going to do if we're going to live lives of God-directed self-control, then we will have to map out repentance and replacement. Right, where we repent of our sins by turning away from those areas of corruption and replace those vices with virtues. So most simply, like if we're just, as an example, if we're talking about this area of faith, we know that we're talking about the Word of God as a means of grace, the discipline of prayer as a means of grace. So even as we're just considering the, the Word and, and prayer, is there neglect of these things in our lives, because we really can't abide in Christ and have fellowship with him if we're not abiding in his word, if his word isn't abiding in us. And that doesn't mean you have to be studying the Bible for an hour a day, but it does mean that while you uh, may not be in the word every single day, the word can be in you every single day as you meditate and bring to mind the scripture that you do know. So, Does there need to be confession? Where does there need to be repentance? Are there secret sins? Are you finding yourself in your heart hostile towards God or bitter over your circumstances? As you consider your relationship with God, the question is, what do I need to address? Where is my heart and my habits? Because once you identify that, then you are able to step into the work of self-control. So faith is one aspect, love is another. It's another arena, right? Um, and, and for me, this is a big part of life because, you know, faith, of course, is in everything, um, but you can address that fellowship aspect specifically. Here, love is something that I think most of us need to address very specifically because it's, it has to do with our relationships, the relationships that we have with each other. So listen to John 13, 34 through 35. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, 
that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So, as I'm looking at my life and recognizing where I need to put forth more effort, more self-control, as I am empowered by the Spirit and submitting myself to the will of God, whom should I be loving? And most simply, right, you could say family, friends, and neighbors, most simply. Your family, maybe that's your spouse, your children, your parents, your siblings, whatever your family dynamic is, you're called to love them. And of course, you're called to love your friends. They're not blood, but they are like blood. Maybe we're talking about your church in this context. Um, we could be talking about the, the people that you are close to and spend a lot of time with. You're supposed to love them. And even, of course, your neighbors. And your neighbors aren't just those people that you like and barbecue with. Your neighbors are the people that you come into contact with in your city. Your neighbors. We're called to love them. Now, how are we called to love them? That's the real question, right? Now, this is where I begin to find failure in my own life. Okay, so um, love, if we're supposed to love like Jesus loves, and we're talking about love that looks like sacrifice and service and affection and uh, initiation, right? Taking the initiative to move first towards somebody. It's a, it can be as, as dramatic as great personal cost to yourself to serve them, or it could look as simple as checking in on somebody to see how they are doing and then listening to how they're actually doing. So when I look at myself, maybe I'll see, well, you know what, as a friend, I could do a lot better in representing Christ to the people that I care for. Um, I could do a lot better in taking the initiative to, to see that they are okay and to see to it that they are okay, right? In other words, to help them where they need it. So you got to examine your heart and your habits in these relationships, considering the command of love. You're asking, right, where do I need to repent? And so in these relationships, maybe the big picture question to be asking is, am I selfish or am I selfless? And maybe maybe you'll see, well, it's, it's a little bit of both. But be more specific. Am I a taker or am I a giver? Am I offering of myself in the context of my marriage, my, my home, my, my friendships, or am I only taking? And what does it look like? When was the last time I served and sought out uh, the good and the, the holiness and the happiness of this individual? You see, once you begin to diagnose weaknesses and strengths in these various arenas, you then begin to know exactly what to do next in terms of controlling or submitting your life to the will of God. Let's talk about a third arena, work. And here I, I mean more specifically the work that you do for uh, uh, money. The, the work that supports your life financially, of course, it applies to all work. I mean, we could use Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24 as the basis of this. Whatever you do, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. This is huge for us. This should be paradigm-shifting, uh, perspective-altering sort of truth as, as we look at our careers or our jobs. Maybe you don't have a career. Maybe you just have a job that pays the bills barely. Or maybe you have a career. Maybe you love your career. Maybe you hate your career. Maybe you think your career was a total mistake. Maybe you really understand what you do as vocation or calling. Maybe your work situation is temporary. It's not something that you're going to be doing long term. Or maybe it is. Maybe you've been at it for 20, 30 years, and you intend to take it all as far as you can, all the way to retirement. You see, here you, again, you have to check your heart and your habits. Right? you got to check your heart. Like, how am I feeling? What's my orientation here? Um, am I... 
Am I filled with a desire to honor the Lord and to honor my employers? Or am I cheating? Am I slacking? Am I stealing? Am I coasting? You see, a lot of people in their jobs, we will feel justified in doing the wrong thing because we feel as if we're being wrong. Like, so in other words, they're not paying me what I'm worth, so I'm not going to try very hard. Or my boss is a bully and a total jerk. And so, you know, I can't really quit, but to get back, I'm just going to steal stuff from the office. or I'm going to take stuff from the work site or the job site. We will justify our sins in the workplace because of what we perceive to be unfairness. So we got to check our heart and our habits, and begin to investigate what repentance looks like in this arena specifically for us, not in general, not for other people, but for us. And it helps for me to begin to ask, for whom am I working? Yes, you have an employer, and he or she may be a a great boss or a terrible boss. But you work for somebody. But Paul tells us, that we have to recognize and live with the understanding that ultimately we don't work for them, that person, we work for the Lord. So in all that we do, right, whether it's pleasurable or painful, whether it's rewarding and fulfilling or just absolute drudgery that you hope to get out of as soon as possible, we are called to work for Jesus in that specific context. So we have to ask, for whom am I working? Do I need to, you know, in addressing my heart and my habits, do I need to make a shift there? Have I forgotten who I am working for? And what are you working for? That's another way to ask it. What am I working for? Are you working for a paycheck? That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Uh, Jesus himself says that the, that you know, and, and Paul, actually, they both make this point in different ways, that uh, people are worth their work. Right, that, uh, that, that we earn our pay in this life for the jobs that we get. And so that's not bad. That's fine. But what are you working for beyond that? Are you working for the honor of God, for the pleasure of God? Are, are you, or are you only working to get paid? You see, if we leave Jesus out of the equation, then it becomes a lot more difficult to put forth a 100% at our place of employment uh, because we're constantly measuring what our output is based on what the return is. And you see that the Protestant work ethic essentially argued that we work for the Lord so there is value and dignity in what we do, no matter what it is, no matter whether it's appreciated or not. It is for God's glory. And if we do it in faith for Him, It honors him and is as spiritually rewarding as any other vocation, missionary work, Bible translation, or throwing garbage for a living or paving roads. It all glorifies God. So we have to understand for, you know, who are we working for and what are we working for and how am I working? Am I working hard? Am I am I giving of myself? Am or am I robbing my employer by holding back what I should be giving forth? So consider work. Um, Some people need to repent for working too much and putting too much of their time towards that and neglecting the arena of love and maybe their family. So you have to look at these arenas, faith, love, work, health, and rest, and evaluate what needs to change. Where specifically do I need to repent? These categories or arenas, as I'm calling them, are helpful for me to begin to investigate. Number uh, four, health. Health is an arena, and here I am specifically talking about our physical, mental, and emotional health. Um, Let me give you one passage to consider. 3 John, verse 2. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. It's a really interesting prayer that John is praying for their health, their physical health, their holistic health. 
Because he, he specifically says, I, I want it to go well with your soul, so I want you to be spiritually lively, and I want your faith to be robust, and I want you to be on fire, and I want you to be godly, and I, all, all of that. But he says, but I also, I'm praying for you to be in good health, for your mind and your body and your emotions to be strong. I want you to be strong. He prays for that because it's valuable. And too many of us are too quick to throw aside the physical uh, health that we should be investing in. A lot of our trouble, a lot of my trouble in this life, a lot of my struggles comes from not taking health seriously. So listen, I'm not Obviously, I'm not going to hold myself up as the example of how you should live your life. I am not the example. Jesus is, a, is the example, and there are good examples out there that we can learn from. I'm not suggesting that I'm that guy. What I am suggesting is that I need to learn from those examples and evaluate my life and learn self-control and self-discipline in this specific area. It's not about getting ripped. It's definitely not about clearing your chakras or whatever that nonsense is. That's not the idea. We're talking about caring for our mind and body that God has given us to be stewards of so that we can carry out all of the work effectively that he gives us to do. And so while you might be providentially limited or hindered in some ways physically or, or mentally or emotionally, the better care we take of the body and mind that we have, the better enabled and equipped we will be to do the things that God calls us. So when you're looking at your heart and your habits in relation to your health, your physical, emotional, and mental health, simply start with this. Am, am I seeing self-destructive habits or self-disciplined habits? Because they tend to be one or the other. Because we're talking about habits. So... A self-destructive habit is overeating, um, over-drinking. Uh, you know, self-disciplined habits doesn't mean you can't have the food or the drink, but it means that you control your portions and the frequency with which you eat those, those uh, maybe high-calorie meals. We don't want to call brothers and sisters to... Think of the body and the mind like the world does. But we do want to call one another to be serious about the body that God gave us and the mind that God gave us so that we can make the most of the callings in our lives. Now, I think that um, you know, eating and exercise, those are important. So is, uh, so is sleep. <laughs> so is counseling. Because we're talking about mental health, emotional health, physical health. It's not just one thing. Like a, a lot of us need, some of us need accountability. Some of us need a professional counselor. Some of us, uh, some of us need, need to be more open with the people in our lives. Like your, your health is not just one thing. Right? So it's not hitting the gym five days a week or whatever. Um, going to the gym might be a part of it, but it might be as simple as just going for a walk every day. You know. So are we self-destructive or self-disciplined? Are we? How are we addressing our eating habits, our sleeping habits, our exercising habits? This will have a huge impact on the, on the rest of your life and the whole of your being. It was important enough for the apostle to pray for people's health, so we ought to also pray for it and, of course, live lives of self-discipline to pursue it. Finally, fifthly, we'll say a rest, the arena or the area of rest. Now, this could have just gone right under health, and it probably belongs there. But I know for me in my life, especially historically as I look back, I haven't taken rest seriously enough, and I don't think most people do. I think people struggle enough with rest in two, in, in two directions that it deserves, at least in, in my mind, its own category. Now, rest is something that God models for us, right? After he created the heavens and the earth, after he created all things, um, he rested on the seventh day, it says in Genesis 2, 3. And of course, in Exodus 20, uh, when God gives us the Ten Commandments, he tells us to remember the Sabbath and to rest from our work, 
right? We worked our six days. The seventh day, you rest. You cease from your labors. God's built it into the created order for a number of reasons that we do need rest. And without going into all of the arguments for why rest is important, let me just encourage you um, that it is likely that you are resting either too much or too little. Probably one or the other, right? I mean, it, it, very few people I know are super balanced in this. Now, some people are resting too little. And I know a lot of Christians do this. Where they are passionate, hardworking. They want to be faithful and fruitful in all that God calls them to do. So they give themselves to their calling, their vocation. And they are constantly making up excuses as to why they cannot rest. Don't have time, got too much to do. Um, I, and there's also sometimes this fear of being lazy. I, they, people feel guilty when they rest. Um, they feel like they should be doing something when they're lying down. And the idea of a nap, and for some people, people, some people view naps as weakness. I was one of those guys for a long time. Naps are for super old people, sick people, and lazy people not for regular, healthy, hardworking people. Of course, I was an arrogant fool for even having that perspective and maintaining it for so many years. When it comes to rest, you got to check your heart and your habits. Both, right? Your heart. Um, so for example, if you're resting too little, why don't you think you need that rest? Are you proud? Are you arrogant? I mean, sometimes I think we have a hard time understanding just how proud we are. Because maybe you'll say, like, I can't rest because if I don't do this, no one else can. If I don't do this now, then it's essentially what we might be saying is if I don't do what I'm supposed to do right here and ignore the call to rest, then God will not accomplish what needs to be accomplished here. It's almost as if we sometimes make the argument, Lord, nobody, you can't use anybody unless you use me. And sometimes we're saying, Lord, um, what you call me to do in rest isn't as important as what you call me to do in work. So we've got to check our hearts. How are we thinking? Um, and maybe, maybe you're resting too much, Right? The Bible calls that laziness, sloth. Some of us rest not too little, but too much. And there are periods in time where you need extra rest, but there are also periods of time where we are just taking advantage of the situation and uh, we're, we're playing the sluggard. You got to check your heart and your habits. What am I doing? What should I be doing? See, when we look at our life, when I look at my life, in these five environments, arenas, areas, it helps me to begin to see how much self-control I actually have or lack. And so when it comes to my faith and what it, my relationship with the Lord, I can begin to look very specifically. And then I consider love in my relationships with, with people, family, friends, neighbors. I look at my attitude, my heart. I look at my habits, my actions. I consider work and my responsibilities that I have. I, I consider my health and rest. If you're going to take obedience to God seriously, and if you desire to experience God in sanctification, if you want to look more like Jesus, then you will believe, you will trust, but you will also work. Not in your own strength, according to the strength that he provides, but you will try. And not just try harder, but you will try to submit yourself to the will and the ways of God, knowing that whether you fail or succeed in these specific areas, the Lord loves you and nothing can separate you from that love. But you got to consider these environments. At least I think it's important to consider these environments, these arenas, 
because self-control and self-discipline can only live and thrive in a person who understands his or her calling, his or her responsibilities and needs and weaknesses and strengths. So let's use this as an opportunity to say, all right, maybe I'll jot down these five areas, right? Faith, love, work, health, rest. Where do I need to begin to repent and to turn and to trust, to seek? I want us to be a people who are humble and passionate and hardworking. I want to be a man who is self-controlled. Not because I want to be strong, right? which I do, but I want to be self-controlled because I want to honor the Lord. And I want to show the world that in a world of excess and a culture of excess and self-indulgence, that the Lord calls us to a life that is more satisfying and more joyful, though more restrictive. Life can simultaneously be more restrictive than what the world is offering and yet more enjoyable and, in many senses, more free.